It's episode 221 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Find all of the shows over at hankgarner.com, and while you're there, please subscribe. There's links over in the right-hand sidebar. I'd like to tell you about some sponsors that I'm very happy to have today. Pico's House. Uh, Authors, if you're looking to take your book to the next level, you need to talk to my friend Crystal Pico Watanabe from Pico's House. She offers developmental editing, line editing, beta reading, and proofreading. She will soon be launching a book interior design service, print formatting. Uh, But you can inquire about that now if you're interested. She's edited over 70 novels and novellas and 130 short stories. And she comes recommended by best-selling authors such as Hugh Howey and Samuel Peralta. Most of her experiences with science fiction, speculative fiction, and middle grade fantasy, but she enjoys all genres and would love to talk to you about your book project. She offers complimentary two-page sample edits and complimentary track changes review after the edit. Visit picoshouse.com and let her know that you heard about it on Author Stories and she'll give you a discount. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com. Galactic Satori Chronicles, written by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks, is a raucous sci-fi adventure introducing Asher, a young man whose world is turned upside down when he discovers that his fiancée's death has been directly caused by an imminent alien invasion. He and his friends channeled his anger and grief into the ultimate weapon against alien technology. Human emotions were the one thing the Kron didn't account for when they started their attack on Earth. Book 1 Earth and Book 2 Kron are now available. Galactic Satori Chronicles. Thirdscribe.com has recently released their newest update and it is amazing. Authors, you need a platform to showcase your work and to connect with readers. Readers, I I know that you like to connect with your favorite authors. Third Scribe is the place to do that. Go visit thirdscribe.com, check out the all new features, and uh, give it a shot. Thirdscribe.com. My good friend Stefan Boltz has recently released a new book and it's called Six String. Jennifer Dalton dreamed of being a singer for as long as she could remember. That dream has kept her alive throughout a childhood mired in poverty in a broken and abusive home. When her younger brother dies and her mother takes refuge in alcohol, the emotional toll becomes unbearable. One morning she runs away, taking with her the one thing she owns, her beloved six-string guitar. This is the story of a girl finding herself alone in the good and the bad, the friends she makes, and a choice that can rob her of everything she's won. Six String by Stefan Boltz. Tears of Heaven Flames of Perdition, Book 1 by R.A. McCandless, a child of angels and humans, Dell is a sarcastic, fast-talking, dangerous, and unpredictable demon hunter. She and her partner, Marin, take their orders directly from the angel, Ahadiel. They obey, or they'll be destroyed. It's not the job Dell wants, but it's the job she has. Normally, banishing a rogue demon back to hell wouldn't be a problem. Dell and Marin have a few centuries of experience. It's all part of the job description. But when Ahadiel orders them to take down three demons at once, the job goes from bad to worse. The demons with supernatural powers and their own agenda have kidnapped children for their own nefarious ends. With angels breathing down her neck, children saving demons gunning for her blood, Dell is running out of time. That's exactly where she wants to be. If you're a fan of Dresden Files, you're going to love this book. Tears of Heaven, Flames of Perdition, Book 1 by R.A. McCandless, and Book 2 is about to drop anytime now. More news about that coming soon. Thanks to my good friend Ed Gosney. With over 100 episodes of cool comics in my collection to date, Ed Gosney highlights comic collecting and fandom in a whole new light. Each week, Ed peels back the layers of your favorite comics and brings you something new. Featuring books in his personal collection as well as some that got away, Cool Comics in My Collection is your go-to for comics nostalgia. EdGosney.com Hey authors, you know that your book has to be edited to the highest quality standards to set it apart from the pack, but what about the visual presentation? Kevin Summers at LiteraryOutlaw.com offers the very best in artisanal book formatting to make your book shine. Visit LiteraryOutlaw.com and tell Kevin you heard about him on Author Stories and receive a discount. Kevin is who I use for my book formatting. He carries the Author Stories seal of approval. LiteraryOutlaw.com I'd also like to thank Dragon Award winner Richard Fox for sponsoring the show. Pick up his series, The Ember War. 
There's nine books in the series. If you're like me and you're constantly looking for something new to read, but you don't want to get into something that's not got any depth to it, you can pick up The Ember War. The Earth is doomed. Humanity has a chance. In the near future, an alien probe arrives on Earth with a pivotal mission. Determine if humanity has what it takes to survive the impending invasion by a merciless armada. The Ember War. Start with book one. You can read them for free on Kindle Unlimited. Pick them up today. The Ember War, nine book series by Dragon Award winner Richard Fox. Stay tuned after the show for an audio book clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Really excited to bring this show to you this week. Peter Cordron is with me uh, on the show, and he is no stranger to the uh, the science fiction community. And uh, I, we were just talking just a second ago, and we, we've kind of... Uh, talked with one another uh, over the years and just never gotten our schedules to sync up. So I'm really happy uh, that he's got a brand new book uh, that releases uh, today when you're hearing this. And it was a great time to have Peter come on the show. So welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm so happy that, uh, that we could work it out. Um, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, okay. Well, this is a this is an interesting one. Um, in high school, uh, myself and a couple of friends were talking in an English class, and the English teacher got um, quite annoyed, sent us out of the room, and gave <laughs> us uh, some sheets of paper and said, "Look, you know, you need to write an apology. You're out of line. You've been disruptive. Um, so you can sit out here for the rest of the session, and I want a, a two page apology." Oh wow! And so. Uh, the other guys I was with started writing, you know, I'm sorry for talking in class over and over again and just repeating that. And I, I couldn't do it. I, I, I'm sitting there. I'm going, yeah, I can't write two, the same sentence several hundred times on two pages. So I started drafting um, a, a film script, if you like, you know, um, The Apology, you know, by Peter Cordron and, <laughs> and uh, you know, wrote who the director was and the producer and sound effects and, you know, special effects and, and, um, you know, who the actors would be playing the parts and all this sort of stuff. And, and finally you get down to the story, you know, and it's a, it's a story about a, a disgruntled teacher taking out her anger on an innocent student. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then there's the credits afterwards. And I managed to fill two pages with this and, and so my, my teacher comes out, uh, bless her heart, and uh, she looks at the papers from the other two students, and then she gets to mine, and she starts going red, and then she just smiles and bursts out laughing. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I think she could appreciate that, um, you know, yes, I was in the wrong, and, uh, and you know, here was the apology, begrudgingly so, um, <laughs> but, uh, but that I, I couldn't just you know, conform to something that was, um, uh, you know, completely unproductive. I had, I had to have a creative outlet. And, uh, and so I think that was really my first sort of glimpse that, um, you, you know, there's a, a love for spinning a yarn. <laughs> right. And, and you got a laugh out of her. So uh, no matter what the punishment is after that, you still won. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess it was mutual. We both won. She got her two pages. I got my laugh. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Did uh, was she one of those teachers that that recognized you know the uh, the gift or the spark or, or whatever you want to call it? Did, did she challenge you further from that, or or uh, did, was that kind of the end of of the creative relationship with that teacher? Oh no, she was a, a brilliant teacher. I I think. Um, you know, the, the educational system as a whole is geared towards certain types of people. Yeah, you know, I, talk, I talk about this with my kids. Um, I've got uh, a son and two daughters, and the two girls are in high school, and they're very different. Um, one of them thrives on intensity of study, and she'll just, you know, pop in some earphones, and she will 
zone out and she'll just burn through, you know, pages of work. She'll, she'll do essays that are, you know, six, 7,000 words. And I'm, I'm just like, what? <laughs> yeah. um, my other daughter really struggles with that. And, uh, but for her, she's very socially minded. And so she'll go to uh, like a cafe uh, or a mall and sit with some of her friends and study. Um, and for her, that works. You know, uh, she was really struggling with maths this year, um, was uh, falling behind in her grades and went and studied with one of her friends. Um, and, I, and I encouraged it because I could see that, you know, this was her learning style. She's just so social that, you know, for her to shut out all of those inputs doesn't make sense. And, right. and so she studied with this other girl and got 99% in a trigonometry class. Uh, you know, That's so she, amazing. Yeah, she was over the moon. And so, I, you know, I think the education system is geared towards a very classical approach to education. And we're just not all cut from the same mold. You know, we're, we're all slightly different. And, uh, and, and so a lot of times, you know, per, perhaps when there's, you know, problem children, and I, <laughs> I was certainly one of them, you know, sometimes it's more symptomatic of the fact that, uh, you know, they're looking for other outlets or they learn in a different manner or they have different strengths. And, uh, and, and like I say, I, I see that just in the microcosm of my own family. Yeah, I, I have to fully agree with you there. I was uh, I, I was one of those kind of troubled students uh, as well that I, I didn't really learn how to learn until I was out of school. Uh, you know, and then then you're on a lifelong quest to uh, to to learn as much as you can, and uh, once you kind of figure out how it works for you, uh, and it's it's really sad that our educational system really kind of leaves uh, some of those kids, uh, you know, uh, on the on the side. It's it's really. Uh, I wish there was a better way, but, you know, I guess we have what we have. Yeah, and I, I think that's where, um, you know, one of the great things about the Internet is the accessibility of information. And it's one of the great things about um, just the modern world in which we live. You know, you go back a couple of hundred years ago and the proportion of people that could read was, you know, a tiny percentage of the population. And then even out of that group, those that had access to information was even smaller again. Um, and, and so now we live in this age where, you know, uh, you know, I think there's even a meme going around, you know, you've got uh, handheld computers that have the power to, you know, pull up all the information that has ever been researched and we use it to look at cat videos. You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but but, but it, it does mean that, uh, I, I, I think, you know, that people can engage in learning, um, you know, beyond school and in learning in a way that suits them and that works for them. And certainly when I write, I try to make science the, the quiet hero in the story or, or, you know, science is one of the characters. And I try to weave in, um, you know, part of the narrative without being preachy or without, you know, doing information drops, but really to just make it part of the backdrop um, to try to raise the profile of science so that, you know, people do become a bit more curious. And perhaps the next time they see an article about, you know, Cassini in orbit around Saturn, or they see an article about vaccinations, or they see an article, you know, you know about um, uh, biology, you know, they maybe dig a little bit deeper. They've got a bit more respect, a bit more understanding of things and they they said you know I'm, i'd like to learn a bit more about that and and uh and and not stop learning just because they're you know no longer in school or college right right and i i like the way that you uh describe uh science or the uh the process of learning or however you want to call that as as an uh, integral character in your stories and I, I know a lot of your work has been compared uh with uh like andy weir um in even though that's that's really not a great uh comparison because i feel like your work uh is different in in a lot of different ways uh but you know for that's a, a 
you know, Andy's kind of become a cultural touchstone that we can we can refer to. Uh, but one thing that really works about you know he does a lot of dumping of facts and and figures, but but he couches it with humor and uh, it, with the, you know the very the very human story uh, you know that he's telling in the Martian, and uh, and that's something that that you do really well uh, as well is that it it doesn't matter how much information you dump on a reader if they don't care about the characters. Uh, so when you're, when you're crafting a story and, and we'll get back to, to some of your history in just a minute, I, I'm kind of bouncing around, but, but you kind of triggered something in my mind. I, I want to get your opinion on, uh, when, when you're crafting a story, what comes first, the, the scenario that you want to write about, or maybe the human problem of the scenario? Oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, one of the dangers of science fiction, and I certainly fell for this myself uh, in a lot of my earlier stories, uh, is you know for it all to be about the idea and not about the people. And as you say, you know, it, if you don't care about the people, you don't care about the story. Um, right. But the other side of that is, uh, if you just have mundane people that don't do anything, uh, then that becomes a boring story as well. Yes, yeah, um, and that's where, you know, the, there's the great phrase, the, you know, plot is the character in action, right. and 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 when I write, I, I certainly try to do that. I, I, I try to, I, I normally come up with a scenario, a, a concept like, you know, um, uh, something like retrograde. The thinking behind that book was um, based on movies like Prometheus and Alien Covenant, where common sense just goes out the window. Yeah. You know, you know, uh, right. As, as much as I loved Prometheus, you know, the visuals were spectacular. The, you know, just the sweeping vistas of alien worlds and spaceships. And, you know, it, it was just breathtaking. It really was. And, and yet, you know, as soon as these astronauts sit down on this planet, they go, Oh, the air is breathable. Let's take off our helmets. You know, <laughs> There's not, <laughs> it would just, it would never happen. It would absolutely never happen. Uh, you know, and then I think there's one scene in that movie where some alien snake rises up and, you know, a guy decides to poke it with his finger. <laughs> <laughs> because that always works out well. Yeah. And, yeah. and so they, you know, they destroyed the story essentially. Um, and so when I was writing retrograde, the idea behind it was, well, hang on. If you really were colonizing another world like Mars, the people that would be involved would be so highly trained, so highly disciplined. They would have such moral integrity. They would be, um, you know, they would be used to be able, able to work with each other, resolving frictions, you know, technically very competent. What is the one thing that would shake them? And what I realized is that you know, you could prepare for every eventuality on Mars except for one. And that is what happens when things go to hell on Earth. And so the whole story is based on the idea that this colony is established, but it's very much a fledgling colony. It's relying on resupply from Earth. And they really can't handle anything that's thrown at them on the planet. They've, you know, they've, they're, you know, they're, they're highly skilled smart intelligent people but when war breaks out on earth uh you know they're all of a sudden faced with the challenge of loyalty you know are we loyal to the colony or are we loyal to our countries that are at war mm. and so we've got these four different parts of the of the colony you know the american module the chinese module the russian module and the eurasian module and they're now lobbing nuclear weapons at each other who do we trust? And and so that you know, it, it tried to say, well, you know, this is something that would shake them to their core. This is something that they would grapple with, and and then it's a case of placing the characters. And then then I, the way I approach it is, I start to think, okay, well, now, what vantage point will we have into that story as it unfolds? You know, will it be from the perspective of someone in the Chinese module, the U.S. module? Will it be from one of the leaders, one of the people who's a subordinate, and, and 
I start sort of fleshing it out from there and start to realize, okay, yeah, the, you know, the best path through this is going to be from the perspective of this particular character. And then, you know, that's when I jump into writing the story. Uh, you know, a lot of great science fiction uh, are, it is kind of based in some really great thought experiments. Uh, you know, if, if this happens, then how will that play out? Um, the, it sounds like a lot of the plot of retrograde, uh, could really be taken out of uh, out of today's headlines, you know, with a little tweaking and a, a little technology dropped in, uh, maybe you know, move the calendar a little forward in the future. But uh, you know, these are <laughs> these are very real questions that uh, you know, that that we're wrestling with right now. Uh, you know, the the world is is kind of a scary place, and it's really cool that uh, science fiction allows us to remove ourselves just enough from the reality of of these uh you know uh these scenarios to really kind of wrestle with with what it means to be uh you know a member of society and and loyalties like you talked about um that's uh, i really love that aspect of it yeah it's interesting you know if you think about why fiction um you know wh- why do we like fiction it's it's actually very counterintuitive and illogical really when you think about it you know uh everyone loves you know star trek and the logic of spock but very few people you know sort of stop and go actually it's illogical to like spock because he's an entirely fictional character (laughs) (laughs) um and and it comes back to um uh, you know i i think it, it comes back to the fact that um intelligent species role play to learn and and you see this all through the animal kingdom so you know an eagle will teach its uh fledgling children how to hunt by you know um flinging a dead carcass in the air and allowing it allowing its younger um children to to soar in and and grab it as it falls you know Uh, they're essentially playing uh you know you see the same thing with you know lions and and cubs, and when it comes to humans, you know we're uh, have a, a huge amount of intelligence, and the the challenge is how do you apply that intelligence to succeed and to get ahead in life, and I, I think the way that fiction arose uh, historically was it's a way of role playing, a way of um, immersing yourself in a scenario in a situation and seeing how it plays out to understand the implications and, you know, and to better understand yourself. Um, and, and, you know, and I certainly see that in the fiction that I read, you know, I'll, I'll read something and you, you know, there, there comes a point in a good book where you're no longer reading, you're experiencing. Right. Um, you know, the, when you think about the mechanics of it, you know, it's, black marks on a white piece of paper. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And yet, and yet somehow in the mechanics of the mind, you know, you're, you're there um, in the story and you're, you're interacting with these characters and you're, you know, you're, you're feeling a sense of trepidation, you know, when they are exposed to certain dangers and things like this. And you, you have an interest, you want to learn more, you want to see where it's going to lead and and that's all part of that, uh, you know. I think uh, that that process of how intelligence originally evolved and and how uh, fiction is essentially exercise for the mind. It's exercise for the emotions, for the for the empathy side of our uh, being. You know, it, it gives us that chance to experience life from a different perspective. From from a vantage point we would never actually have. And so, you know, um, George R. R. Martin's got that great line in um, uh, Game of Thrones, you know, uh, uh, the man who doesn't read, uh, you know, has, has essentially wasted his life. A, a reader lives a thousand lives. And it's just so true. You know, that's, um, we, we live vicariously through these books. Right, and and at some point uh, the experience becomes transcendent, and and we become one with the characters, or maybe not one with the characters, but we are, um, we we experience them like a you know like family. It's it's really yes. weird how we get 
connected to to stories and to characters. Uh, I, I know we've all finished a book that we really connected with, and then when it was over, you, you almost uh, have a sense of loss uh, that it's over with. You know, it's a uh, it's it's really a, a bizarre experience when you really start to you know take it apart. Yeah, yeah, it's quite yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, so we talked earlier about your your first memory of wanting to be a writer, but at what point did you know uh, that okay, this is something I actually want to do? It's something I believe I can do. And uh, you know, how did you start off uh, to you know start writing stories? Yeah, um, I was. Um reading quite a lot of works by an Australian author, uh, Matthew Riley, and he does a lot of sort of science fiction action adventure. And I was becoming frustrated with them. You know, he, he had a couple of books in particular that I thoroughly enjoyed the first half of, and then the second half just deteriorated. And I found myself wishing that the story had gone in a different direction or found myself realizing that, you know, a, you know, a huge opportunity had been lost in the story, but, you know, instead of going left, it went right. And, and that was when I sort of started toying with the idea that, you know, well, uh, may, maybe I should be writing the stories I want to read. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, and I did that for probably, um, four or five years, maybe a bit longer, uh, with stories that just ended up in a drawer, you know, they and they'll never see the light of day. Matter of fact, I, I don't think I've even got them anymore. <laughs> um, but uh, then uh, the the real stepping stone for me came with Anomaly, which was the first book I published on um, Amazon, uh, and it came out right around the same time as Hugh Howey's Wool, and so Hugh and I would sort of correspond and chat to each other. Um, and, you know, and it was, it was a story that looked at, again, sort of taking a certain angle It said, you know, we see first contact in the movies, you know, the aliens come down in spaceships and they hover over cities or they, they land and they walk out of their spaceships and all this sort of stuff. But it asked the question, how different could first contact actually be, you know, just how different could it be beyond our expectations and um and 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 when i published it you know i i um uh, you know I, I put it out there and it it got ravaged in the first <laughs> probably d oh. dozen or so reviews you know amateur writing you know terrible characterization characterization needs editing you know poor grammar um and so the book's actually been re rewritten about four or five times <laughs> as I've sort of lifted it up and improved some of the character depth and all that. Um, but the other spinoff that I hadn't intended was a lot of people reached out to me and said they really loved it. You know, they, they uh, felt that they learned something, they, they connected with the characters. And I started uh, hearing from people that were scientists or engineers um, and, you know, so this entirely unexpected side effect came where I started making friends with people all around the world. I, I remember one guy um, uh, uh, was the founder of AutoCAD. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know if you know that. It's the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, he, he read it, absolutely loved it, wrote to me and, you know, said, oh, you know, did you consider this and wanted to chat about a few elements oh, of the story. Cool. And... Yeah, and, and, and since then, you know, with uh, Retrograde, um, uh, Ben Honey, who's one of the uh, flight controllers on the International Space Station in uh, Houston, uh, read the book, um, al along with um, uh, Dr. Andrew Rader, who's one of the senior engineers at SpaceX. Uh, you know, they both provided input into Retrograde to help refine some of nice. the content. Uh, and. and yeah, and, and that's just been uh, an amazing privilege. You know, it's humbling to, uh, you know, to, to write something that is just fiction. You know, it's, at the end of the day, it's make-believe. Right. You know, it's um, fanciful. Um, but, you know, to connect with people who are, you know, actually making the world a better place that are, you know, have these careers where they're trying to 
be a part of something that is reaching out and and changing you know the future um uh, so that you know that's just been very humbling and and that's just been this unexpected payoff that came from writing and it's one of the reasons i love uh, writing i i love hearing from people around the world you know um I was chatting this morning to someone from Slovakia. You know, uh, <laughs> if you'd asked me, you know, would I ever do that? Was, you know, I would have said no. That just sounds completely sublime. But there you go. Well, you know what? Uh, what really jumps out at me as you tell that story, and and I I know this has to uh, uh, to be a good feeling for you, uh, is that. You know, um, all those things are really important, the the editing and, uh, you know, proper grammar and the, all the mechanics and getting that stuff right. That's that's all absolutely important because, uh, uh, you know, anything that takes people out of the story obviously uh, is not doing the writer any favor. So, uh, you know, we absolutely uh, want when we put a product out to have it the best it can be and, and put a great cover on it so it catches people's attention and all that. All that being said – uh, you can, uh, you know, you can have two writers side by side and one, uh, has perfect mechanics, uh, but can't tell a story. And the other one knows how to tell a story and really can grab the reader's attention. Uh, but maybe they need to bring someone in that can help them to clean up and polish all that stuff. Um, knowing that the, the first thing that you put out there really connected with readers, uh, that has to be a fantastic feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I've I've had the privilege of working with um, a lot of people that have helped me refine my writing over the years. Um, whenever I get uh, criticised in a review, um, I, I like to look at other books that person yes. has reviewed <laughs> uh, to see what right. they enjoyed. And to try to learn, well, you know, because I think there's a, a contract between a writer and a reader. Um, and, you know, the, the, the reader wants to have that level of, you know, where their disbelief is suspended. And if that gets broken, it, you know, it's a very fragile thing. Um, it can really, as you said before, throw them out of the story. And then it just ruins the experience for them. And they're certainly not shy in letting you know in a review. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then on on rare occasion, uh, you'll run into someone who's just never liked anything, and you know, and you just kind of have to shrug and say, "Well, I, I guess you know that I, I just I guess I'm just not going to reach that reader, you know, and 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 go on." You, you certainly can't please all the people all the time, and you shouldn't try. Right. You'll never uh, produce anything. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, you know, my, my editor, Ellen Campbell, uh, was originally a fan. She reached out to me um, after reading Little Green Men and said, you know, hey, look, I really love this story. Um, but, you know, uh, you've used a homonym here incorrectly. You've got a couple of typos. You might just want to fix this up. And and she was concerned she was going to offend me. And and I wrote back to her and I said, oh, you know, th thank you. This, <laughs> you haven't offended me at all. This is, you know... Um, the book had been edited, but, you know, the challenge with editors is, um, you know, right. we're all human. Things can slip by. Uh, and so their eyes on the more you sort of pick those things up and different editors have different strengths. Uh, and so I've, I've worked with Alan now on, I don't know, uh, probably 15 wow. different novels. Uh, I, I was chatting to her just before the show. She said, you're a big college football fan and, you're a, an avid supporter of uh, Alabama, so roll tide, Hank. <laughs> I'm going to kill you, Ellen. <laughs> oh, we love Ellen. We just think she's uh, she's special. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to switch you up. I love it. I love it. Oh, um, sort of coming back yeah. to retrograde. Um, so. Uh, once Alan had finished with it, I, pu I published uh, Retrograde as Mars Endeavor, and then uh, John Joseph Adams read the book, and you know he's um, uh, you know been at the forefront of you know science fiction in America for you know, best part of a, I sure. think a couple of decades. Um, 
so he went through and gave it a developmental edit, you know, rather than a, sort of a structural edit as Alan had, and you know, came up with a few sort of points to uh, tweak. Uh, and you know, it was just humbling to have someone that's a Hugo Award right. winner, uh, you know, sort of providing some input. You know, have you considered this? Have you, you know, do you think perhaps you're a bit strong here, or is this point a bit weak? Um, and you know. Um, given his background i was like you know anything he says i i will re-examine you know nothing's there's no um precious uh darlings there that i'm not willing to to sacrifice to make right. the story better yeah. uh, that, that's a really tough thing uh to, that's that's a uh it shows great maturity as a writer uh to uh, to understand uh when um uh, input from from readers or editors is actually constructive and is actually making the story better. Uh, and when to stand your ground and say no, I I I meant what I said here, and this is you know in my mind and in my heart, this is what makes the story what it is. Um, have you ever? And, and I'm not asking for specifics here, but um, have you ever uh, had the opportunity where you just believed uh, so deeply in a core element of the story? Uh, that that you just didn't want to change something. Yeah, I I do get you know I I don't necessarily change with every sort of input that um, somebody sends my way. I what I do try to do is um, put myself in their shoes and sort of see if it's really justified. And um, you know sometimes it's a difference right. of opinion. Um, and sometimes it's no, there's you know there's a structural flaw yeah. there. You know the the story the you know and, and so it really comes down to saying is the story weaker for that point, or is it just a divergence? You know, at this point you could go left or right, and the story's the same. You know, the, it, neither neither weakens it, or hey, is it actually weaker because of that point? And if it is weaker, then you've just got to be honest and say, okay, well, you know, that's something I should uh, should right. polish up. And, and sometimes just getting a little bit of distance from the story uh, and, and, and giving yeah. it some time. I think Stephen King talks about it in On Writing, you know, taking that, that story, putting it in a, in a desk drawer and working on something else. Uh, and then when you come back to it, you know, you have fresh eyes and, and maybe uh, your pride, uh, you know, isn't so close to it. And, and you can, you know, uh, look at, at the reality of the story. Uh, so I love that. Um, what is your what is your background? Uh, you write very um, well, you write hard science fiction, I think, by your own uh, description. Uh, do you have a science or engineering background? <laughs> uh, no, I wish I did. Um, I, I've sort of come about this the long, slow, torturous way. Um, I was a um, evangelical creationist for almost quarter of a century. Yeah, so so very much into science denial, denial of climate change, all that sort of stuff, um, and. So for me, it was very much a late awakening. Um, and so science fiction is almost therapy for me, if you like. It's a, it's it's me working out some of these bad habits, uh, you know, and and learning myself and trying to capture some of that in the stories. Um, but, yeah, you know, uh, the, the particular group that I was involved with was very suspicious of things like, you know, vaccines, microwave ovens. I mean, it, it, I look back now and it's just laughable. <laughs> But the and the I, I was um, talking with someone else about this recently. But the thing that sort of got me to open my eyes was I was uh, a, a comparison was made between Adolf Hitler and Charles Darwin by by a, a, a religious teacher that I respected at the time, and I remember thinking, you know. I just can't see those two as comparable. <laughs> you know, Adolf Hitler killed millions of people. You know, tens of millions of people died in the Second sure. World War. Mil millions of civilians died. Uh, Charles Darwin sailed on the voyage of the Beagle to the Galapagos and studied nature. Right. 
These are not equivalents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that, that's a, a pretty weak uh, straw man for sure. Yeah, it it is, and and it, and it got me to go back and actually read the, the works of Darwin. So I've got two copies of On the Origin of Species. I've read the book several times now. And what I realized was, you know, uh, Darwin was actually incredibly honest. He was um, very forthright. He, he just wanted to learn. He wanted to understand. He wanted to know how the astonishing diversity of life arose on Earth. And he wrote a letter to a friend of his. This was um, shortly before he published On the Origin of Species. And in it, he said that, you know, when he when he thinks about how species change over generations, he feels like he's confessing to murder. Uh, and those are his exact words. You know, this is a an 18th century gentleman. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, 19th century gentleman in 1850 odd. Um, you know, writing very strong words, uh, but he just had this drive to learn, this hunger to. No, and to not be satisfied with myths and fables. And when I read that in his letters, it, it sparked the same thing in me. I realized, you know, yeah, it, it sort of felt to me a bit like confessing to murder, to consider that uh, evolution um, could be accurate and could be true. Um, and, and that's when I realized, you know, look, uh, I've, I've headed down the wrong path here. I've... Uh, you know, I, I've I've turned my back on the astonishing age in which we live and the remarkable advances that science has afforded me. You know, I, I've just been born into a world where polio uh, is history, where smallpox was eradicated. You know, where um, simple bacterial infections will no longer kill people. You know, I, I did nothing f to deserve that. I, I just inherited that. Uh, and, I, you know, I should appreciate that. I should be aware of just how astonishing these times are and not be suspicious of the science that has, um, that has brought that about. And, and I, I think that's one great thing uh, about fiction uh, and maybe science fiction in particular is that uh, it, it can allow us to uh, – set aside our own preconceived notions, our own prejudices, uh, and look at things uh, with fresh eyes and, and maybe start to question the things that we hold uh, so dear uh, and maybe open up conversations about that. Because um, the, the sad thing is uh, a lot of us believe things uh, about uh, other things or other people, and, and we just take what we've, what we've heard. We don't actually know that. We just... Uh, we're just regurgitating what someone else told us, uh, and it, you know, absolutely like like me with Charles Darwin and that right, exactly. Exactly, <laughs> that's my point exactly. And and where you know at the end of the day, uh, you know, we may decide to to not agree, but at least we can you know look honestly at it and and uh, and say you know well let, let's give it a fair a fair look and see. Uh, and and a lot of that is lost today, sadly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so how did you get into writing hard science fiction? Uh, so obviously you started digging into to kind of uh, maybe disprove the things that you believed, or, or maybe to to look for the truth of things. Uh, maybe not necessarily to just uh, tear apart your whole worldview, uh, but it sounds to me like you, you just really wanted to know the truth about what. Uh, the way things really work. Is that what really got you digging into science, not only natural science, but uh, maybe some of the uh, more technical science? Yeah, well, it, it was sort of realizing that a lot of people were in the same position as me, where, you know, uh, we enjoy the benefits of the age in which yeah. we live without appreciating what it took to get here. Um, you know, you you look at something like, uh, and, and I'm not saying everyone has to necessarily have an understanding of quantum mechanics or Einstein's theory of relativity, but we should have an appreciation that the modern world in which we live is built on these scientific principles. You know, you, you look at something like climate change. Uh, no one is denying the science of 
uh, quantum mechanics because it gives us iPhones and um, you know uh, computers and and things like this. But you know that same scientific method applied to the climate, and all of a sudden, you know, people are up in arms. You're changing my way of life. You want me to stop polluting? You know, <laughs> there's a great cartoon um, that uh, you know has someone. Uh, ob- objecting to climate change, saying, you know, what if climate change is wrong and we're just cleaning up the environment for no good reason? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that's a waste of time. <laughs> and, exactly. And, and so I realized, and, and I was there, you know, I, I, I was like, you know, climate change, it's just a myth perpetuated to, uh, you know, to get us all to become greenies or something. Um, and, and the fascinating thing is these are lies that are perpetuated by uh, corporations and different groups and ideologies, um, you know, to advance their monetary interests. Uh, there's a fascinating study. I, I highly recommend you look it up. But um, companies like Exxon and Mobile uh, and BP, they've known about climate change since the 70s. When they're building an oil rig or they're building a pipeline, they have to take into account engineering uh, designs that are going to last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ahead. And so in the 70s, they were designing their rigs in light of sea rise. They were designing their rigs in light of uh, increased storm surges that they knew were coming because they were looking at the evidence, and yet they chose to publicly um, take the stance that climate change was wrong um, when they were doing the exact opposite. I mean, it's I, I see it now, and it makes my blood boil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the, these guys knew better and chose to mislead and deceive us. And of course, what then happens is very sincere people like myself. Um, believe those lies and, and and we become very passionate about it we become very uh entrenched you know nobody's taken away my fossil fuel burning car <laughs> you know and, and and yet we've been fed a lie we've we've been deceived uh it's really it's it's quite tragic you know p- people talk about fake news and you know that's um something that's become very uh public in yeah. the last sort it's of it's almost become months. a punchline but well, it has. And, and the the reality is what we are seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, the, the, the full iceberg below the surface has been there for, you know, since the 40s and 50s. You know, if you look at the way um, the science against smoking was rebutted by smoking companies and how they became – by their own admission, they became merchants of doubt. Their their whole marketing philosophy was to put doubt about the science so they could continue to make money and profit off uh, cigarettes and basically then the you know the suffering of people that uh, you know uh, succumb to some of these uh, health problems associated with smoking. Uh, that same approach was then adopted by the. Um, the companies wanting to fight climate change because it didn't suit their investment models, and uh, and it's all about ensuring doubt. If you can if you can get the public to doubt a position, um, then you can stall for time and you can keep your existing business model. Uh, and, and so it's you know it, it's quite um, quite shocking when you see that. You know, but yeah, uh, Exxon uh, have you know. You know, uh, openly admitted that you know they were planning on climate change in the seventies and early eighties. So, uh, so when I write, you know, what I'm trying to do, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't think I've ever touched on climate change in any of my books, and I probably never will. What I'm trying to do is raise the profile of science so that science becomes something that people trust rather than something people distrust. So that science becomes something that people respect and recognize as the foundation of modern society rather than something that is suspicious and happens in a back room and can't be understood and, you know, 
scientists are not the wizards of the 21st century. You know, they're, they're human. They're, they're people just like us. Um, the, what they're trying to do is step outside of the normal way of thinking. You know, they're trying to step outside of the normal prejudices and biases and um, the thinking that has led us to superstition and things like this over tens of thousands of years and actually say, let's look at the evidence, let's come up with a model, let's understand reality rather than our own personal bias. And, uh, and, 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 I, and I think that's fundamental to having a good functioning society. I think if, you, if we lose sight of that, if we, if we somehow succumb to this false equivalence that doubt and denial of science is somehow just a, a, a different opinion, um, you know, then, then we, the, things just get worse. Um, and th- and that's what we want to avoid. Well, understanding your uh, your history and and kind of where you're coming from, and and I had a very similar experience. Uh, you know, kind of coming up in a very strict, um, uh, very um, kind of uh, uh, I, I I don't I don't know the word I want to use, but uh, a, a very similar experience to you. I'll just put it that way. Um, and, you know, kind of coming out of that and, and trying to find your own, uh, you know, your own footing and, and kind of how you see the world, uh, you know, while, while respecting people, but, but finding your own way at the same time is, is a very challenging thing. Um, and, and I think yeah. the first book of yours that, that I actually read, and it's really funny in light of that is, uh, My Sweet Satan. And, uh, <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Which, you know, now kind of knowing your history really kind of makes me laugh because, um, uh, because I, I kind of get the inside joke, uh, if you will. Um, but what was, uh, well, f- I, I, I'm not going to ask you to just deconstruct all of your books, but, um, when, you know, of course, that's a very, um, uh, controversial title. It's a very, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure a lot of people saw that and probably had a knee jerk reaction. Uh, but it's really not, uh, what, what you first think it is. Uh, but you, you kind of take the opportunity to kind of poke, uh, at some, uh, you know, some sacred things, uh, and really show a different light to it. Um, is that something you consciously do? Uh, yeah, well, see, my, my sweet Satan is interesting because it's all about um, how we fear the unknown or we fear things from an irrational perspective. Right. You know, when I was growing up in the seventies, you know, backtracking was all the thing. You know, if you play this record oh, yeah. backwards, it says that Paul McCartney is dead, <laughs> or it says, you know, my sweet Satan right. and stuff like this. And, and, yeah, I, I was thinking I of playing Stairway to Heaven backwards uh, when, when I first saw your book because that, <laughs> that was drilled in our head over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the, the interesting thing is it's actually highly plausible. So when we look out into space and we're looking for uh, signals that could be leaking from other civilizations, you know, we're looking for evidence of intelligent extraterrestrials uh, around other stars uh, pretty much only within our own galaxy. We don't really have the ability to detect anything too much far beyond there. But one of the things, one of the challenges is how do you distinguish between an intelligence signal and background noise? Um, as you can imagine, if you get something like a TV signal, um, you know, it, it could be almost indistinguishable from static because there's so many you know, there's motion in it and you're, you're taking this highly complex uh, data set and you're breaking it down into uh, a stream of um, bits of, of, of binary, you know. So how, you know, one of the challenges SETI has is to try to distinguish between static. And one of the things I realized was that if you were another civilization, so you're an alien civilization and you're trying to contact some other alien species. What, what is the best way to ensure that that other species realizes that 
you know, you're you're not just part of the background static. You're not part of the background noise. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is just to repeat their own signal back at them, but to reverse it, because that tells them a couple of very important points. Uh, one, it tells them that somebody is listening, doesn't necessarily understand what they've said, but knows enough to send their own signal back to them in reverse so that they know that it has been actively um, you know, dealt with, it's been actively captured and processed. And of course, that then led to the idea that, well, you know, if that signal happened to include Stairway <laughs> to Heaven, <laughs> we would hear My Sweet Satan and, and then it, it, it sort of, you know, takes off from there. But, but yeah, so there was some science and some uh, rationale and logic behind it that, that um, a very simple distress signal would be to reverse uh, the signal of an intelligent species to say, hey, you know, we need help. You know, uh, we're over here. This is this is not background static. This is you know, and an, an intelligence has you know manipulated this, but we just can't speak your language. Um, so it was a fun book to write, and without giving away any spoilers, you know, the the whole book is really um, about the the last chapter. Yes, you know, the last um, the, the epilogue. Uh, interesting fact for you. Um, Retrograde and My Sweet Satan happen in the same really? universe. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're actually parallel stories. And the original intent was that I'd write these two parallel stories and there would be one sequel for the two books. Nice. And, and, and the one sequel would be a combination of the two. So you'd, you'd get elements of Retrograde, you'd get elements of My Sweet Satan. Um, since then, they've sort of diverged. That was the original plan. I, I'm writing the sequel for Retrograde at the moment, which is called uh, Reentry. Um, and so now I've got to go back and rescue uh, the characters at the end of My Sweet Satan with uh, with an, with another story because I can no longer combine them. Oh, oh no! <laughs> they've sort of diverged. Oh, no. uh, well, that was actually going to be my next question: is uh, that uh, are your stories connected, or in your mind? Uh, wh whether you ever connect them on paper, uh, in your mind as the writer, do these characters occupy the same world, and, and could they, uh, you know, overlap at some point? I've only ever really done one um, sequel, and that was with uh, my zombie book. So, uh, what we left behind has a sequel, All Our Tomorrows, and. Um, the challenge with sequels is you've really got to have a popular first book. You know, if the first book is just selling like wildfire, then it makes a lot of sense to do a sequel. Uh, otherwise, sequels tend to get buried. You know, they, they never get um, as much exposure as the original book. And that was the reason why when it came to the planning for My Sweet Satan and Retrograde, the idea was to do them as parallel books because someone could read either book in the first instance and then go on to the other book or to the sequel. Um, but yeah, so, so generally I don't do sequels. Um, this is kind of the exception. Um, uh, the, the publisher has asked for a, a sequel to retrograde. So I've, I've come up with a uh, re-entry and um, just over halfway through it at the moment. It's absolutely loving it. It's, it's gone in an entirely different direction to what I originally thought. And uh, so that makes it interesting for me as a writer. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so generally I don't do sequels. Well, let me ask you a, uh, a, a writing business question. Uh, we, we don't delve into business an awful lot on the show, but I, th I think this is a great point to bring out. Um, a lot of the conventional wisdom is to write uh, series uh, so that uh, you have – my goodness, I don't know what that was. Uh, so that you have something, you know, to, to constantly bring uh, new readers into. And uh, when they finish one book, so they can go on to the other. Um, but, you know, that, that always, that doesn't always work. And, and it doesn't serve the story always. Um, as a, uh, someone who really broke out in the Kindle revolution like you did, um, what, what have you learned uh, 
about about publishing uh, and in kind of the the business side of it that has really surprised you? Uh, maybe maybe a piece like that that you know always writing sequels doesn't always work. Uh, is there a piece of advice that that you figured out uh, that might be useful to others? Um, that publishing is really hard. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, you know, writing's tough in itself. Um, being read is even more difficult. Um, you know, just uh, reaching an audience is phenomenally hard. Um, it, it's harder now than when I started, which is, you know, quite surprising. Um, uh, you know, I'm selling less books now than when I had only one book available, which I, I find quite counterintuitive, but I think it's just the nature of the market. There's, um, you know, there's so much competition and, um, you know, there's so many great stories out there. It, it's just very hard to get traction. As for strategies, whether the, um, you know, the, the sequels work or the individual books work, I think it does largely come down to the writer themselves. So, um, I, I got a review recently on one of my books that said, you know, if you're wanting to read a fantastic book without getting caught into endless sequels, grab this, you know. And, and so for that reader, it was a breath of fresh air that it wasn't, yeah. you know, one in 20 right. books or something. But but I know for a lot of writers, uh, the series really works. You know, it, it gives them an anchor point and they can really take, readers on a journey through um you know through multiple novels i i know of one writer that has 20 books in a series which i find phenomenal sure, sure. <laughs> my my problem is i couldn't sustain a story yeah. that long um you know uh, and and so I, I think it suits different writers for them it works uh for me i i always want something fresh you know i don't like to repeat stories i i like to I, I love the challenge of something different and unique. You know, um, I've, I've got a few books on my desk here. W you know, one of my favorites of the last couple of years was, uh, you, know, the, you know, that I've written was um, Welcome to the Occupied States of America. And, and the reason I like it so much was it was just so different. It was, uh, you know, it, it was fresh material for me. And so um, when I'm writing, I, I you know, that, that's what sort of inspires me. If, if I was doing a series, of, I, I don't know that I could pull it off. If you know, if I was going for five or ten or fifteen books in a series, I, for me, it would grow stale. Whereas uh, my my writing style suits the um, sort of unconventional, uh, you know, highly different story. I'm, I'm working on five different stories at the moment, wow. and they're all. Yeah, they're all remarkably different. There's Reentry, the, the sequel to Retrograde. Uh, there's one called Apocathery, which is about first contact in the 1500s. And the idea there being that that was really the birth of modern science. And what would an alien race make of us with our superstitions and our medieval mindsets and our slowly emerging scientific understanding? Um yeah, you know, and, and and so that's that's a really interesting uh, concept for me. So I'm enjoying exploring that. Uh, I've got one called uh, Three Ezekiel. So it's it's the word Ezekiel, which is one of the books of the Bible, but with a three instead of the e. And that's a first contact story set in the Congo, in the middle of the nice. jungle. You know, so uh, and, and so I, I try to um, just explore different. Uh, avenues as much as I can, really. Um, uh, I've got another one, Lies. Um, uh, it's called Lies Incorporated, a limited liability company. That's the full title. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, the play on words. Yeah, yeah. L Lies Inc. LLC. And anyone who's a Philip K. Dick fan will know that I do a lot of sort of tribute stuff to his work. He he wrote a book called Lies Incorporated. Uh, yep. It's also known as the the unteleported man. I think it was originally done. Um, so, Lies Incorporated LLC is uh, a story about uh, time traveling assassins, and um, 
And there's a few nods to Philip K. Dick in there. But again, entirely different to three Ezekiel or uh, uh, Apocathery. I love it. I love it. Uh, the new book is called Retrograde. It is out today. Uh, I highly encourage everyone to grab a copy of it today. Let's help Peter uh, have a phenomenal launch for this book. Uh, so uh, all the Author Stories listeners, please uh, rally around Peter and let's go pick up a copy of his book. I know I am. Uh, is the audio book releasing the same day as the book? Yes, it is. Excellent. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm listening to the audio book at the moment, and it's uh, phenomenal. It comes across I, so a, well. I'm a huge audio book fan, and um, uh, that's the only way I'm able to keep up with the the load uh, of doing the show, and and you know just keeping up with with everything going on. And uh, I uh, I'm actually adding this to my Audible uh, queue right now, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be listening to it today when it comes out. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Um, Peter, where awesome. can people find you if maybe they're not familiar with your work? Uh, but you've said something today that really has intrigued them and, uh, and they want to dig into your work. Where can they find you online to, uh, to follow you? Sure. Um, I'm av available on Twitter. Um, the handle is just my name, at Peter Cordron. Um, you can find me on Facebook uh, or uh, you can find all of my books listed on Amazon. Excellent. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you for having me, Hank. It's been great. Roll Tide, buddy. <laughs> See, and, and we didn't even get into uh, Crystal Wat Watanabe wanted to know uh, if all of the things you see in Outback uh, restaurants are, are real. <laughs> oh, uh, as in as in the food? <laughs> as it, she said, be sure to ask him about all the hokey sayings that, that are like on the walls and, uh, you know, all the uh, – the, uh, the, the things that we think are Australian slang and, and things like that. So, Oh, uh, well, yeah, the, um, we, we don't really use crikey that much or, uh, or throw another shrimp on the barbie or anything like that. But, uh, oh, well, that was, uh, that was for you, Crystal. Uh, <laughs> Peter, thank you for, for, yeah. Oh, Chris, Crystal's another one that's edited. Oh, a she's few of my fantastic. Books, so, yeah, she so, is absolutely fantastic. She, she and she and Ellen both, we, we love them to death. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, but thanks for coming on the show, Peter. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Tune in for new episodes every Tuesday and Friday. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Eddie parked his car at the side of the Phillipsburg Mill Pond. He'd been here with lots of girls, but never one as hot as Kate, and she was really into him tonight. Show me your scars. <laughs> My scars? Eddie laughed. Sure. He unbuttoned his shirt for Kate. She raised a hand to his bicep and traced the white lines with one finger. So many. Yeah. I like my scars a lot. And why is that? They're memories. My proofs of purchase. I got jumped once. Want to see? Those are pretty deep. Pretty telltale. My jumpers had knives and I didn't. I like those scars, I guess. I didn't like getting jumped at the time. Kind of was not on my to-do list. Kind of was going to Sonic and getting a damn slushy, but... But it's still a good scar, yeah? Hey, here's the best. He twisted in his seat and pulled his shirt away from his left shoulder. Damn, huh? That was a bad fight. Tell me. I was a freshman, and my dad was a cop in Baltimore. He worked at my school, actually in it. We had a metro, an actual police station, in our school. Forty, fifty, sixty cops there at all times. We had stabbings, we had bomb threats, we had people set fire to shit. We had people set fire to other people. But no shootings in our school. Know why? because all the shootings were in the parking lot. He laughed. So, I'm careful in that lot, right? Usually careful. But I got cornered by these three guys after school. I had some steroids and they wanted them. He flexed. I wasn't as big then, so I got knocked to the ground quick. I'm hurting, but I reach up and grab the first guy's hair. He's got dreadlocks. 
I grab a handful of his hair, pull him down, and start beating the shit out of his face. I'm throwing elbows into his mouth. I'm hitting his mouth on the ground. Kaboom! Kaboom! He takes it for a while, but then he stops moving. Her face lit with delight. It was weird. He wasn't dead, but he stopped moving. No longer a threat. So I move on. I'm still on the ground, so the next guy, I caught a foot. I take the ankle and I twist it. I don't know if I broke it, but it clicked. That's the trick. You just catch it and hold it and spin as hard as you can. His foot went backwards. It was pointing the wrong direction when I was done with it. I know that. And he fell. So kaboom. I beat that guy's mouth on the ground until I don't see any teeth and he stops moving. Two down. That leaves number three. Eddie felt the adrenaline rising. Now I'm still on the ground. I'm just a kid and this dude is like 20. Big, strong guy. I have claw marks on my face. My lips are just blood. There's so much blood on my shirt, I'm pretty sure I looked like I had just murdered a bunch of people. She laughed. He joined in. Angry, bloody-minded laughter. And I've got blood all over my hand, because those first two kissed my fist quite a bit. Kissed it like a slut, pretty much. And I just stand up. I stand up, and this last guy, he looks at me. Eddie's chest heaved, panting. He spoke through clenched teeth now. He just looks at me like I'm Satan, pretty much. And he's like, man. And he waves his hands around and leaves. He doesn't walk, though. He runs, said Kate. Eddie nodded. He runs. And I turn around and guess who's there? Saw the whole thing. Your father. My father. And he comes and takes my elbow, and I know he's got to take me into the station. But when he cuffs me, he leans over and says, I'm proud of you, son. That was a man's 